Chapter Two of A Witch Shall Be Born by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two The Tree of Death. The young soldier's hose and shirt were smeared with dried blood, wet with sweat, and gray with dust. Blood oozed from the deep gash in his thigh, from the cuts on his breast and shoulder. Perspiration glistened on his livid face, and his fingers were knotted in the cover of the divan on which he lay. Yet his words reflected mental suffering that outweighed physical pain. "'She must be mad!' he repeated again and again, like one still stunned by some monstrous and incredible happening. "'It's like a nightmare! Taramis, whom all Kauron loves, betraying her people to that devil from Koth. Oh, Ishtar, why was I not slain? Better die than live to see our queen turn traitor and harlot. Lie still, Valerius, begged the girl who was washing and bandaging his wounds with trembling hands. Oh, please, lie still, darling. You will make your wounds worse. I dared not summon a leech. No, muttered the wounded youth. Constantius's blue-bearded devils will be searching the quarters for wounded Kauranai. They'll hang every man who has wounds to show he fought against them. Oh, Taramis, how could you betray the people who worshipped you? In his fierce agony he writhed, weeping in rage and shame, and the terrified girl caught him in her arms, straining his tossing head against her bosom, imploring him to be quiet. "'Better death than the black shame that has come upon Kor on this day,' he groaned. "'Did you see it, Ivga?' "'No, Valerius. Her soft, nimble fingers were again at work, gently cleaning and closing the gaping edges of his raw wounds. I was awakened by the noise of fighting in the streets. I looked out a caseman and saw the Shemites cutting down people. Then presently I heard you calling me faintly from the alley door.' I had reached the limits of my strength, he muttered. I fell in the alley and could not rise. I knew they'd find me soon if I lay there. I killed three of the blue-bearded beasts by Ishtar. They'll never swagger through Koran's streets by the gods. The fiends are tearing their hearts in hell. The trembling girl crooned soothingly to him as to a wounded child and closed his panting lips with her own cool, sweet mouth. But the fire that raged in his soul would not allow him to lie silent. "'I was not on the wall when the Shemites entered,' he burst out. "'I was asleep in the barracks with the others, not on duty. It was just before dawn when our captain entered, and his face was pale under his helmet. "'The Shemites are in the city,' he said. "'The queen came to the southern gate,' and gave orders that they should be admitted. She made the men come down from the walls, where they'd been on guard since Constantius entered the kingdom. I don't understand it, and neither does anyone else. But I heard her give the order, and we obeyed, as we always do. We are ordered to assemble in the square before the palace, form ranks outside the barracks, and march. Leave your arms and armor here. Ishtar knows what this means, but it is the queen's order. Well, when we came to the square, the Shemites were drawn up on foot opposite the palace. Ten thousand of the blue-bearded devils, fully armed, and people's heads were thrust out of every window and door on the square. The streets leading into the square were thronged by bewildered folk. Taramis was standing on the steps of the palace, alone except for Constantius, who stood stroking his mustache like a great lean cat who has just devoured a sparrow, but fifty Shemites with bows in their hands were ranged below them. That's where the queen's guard should have been, but they were drawn up at the foot of the palace stair, as puzzled as we, though they had come fully armed in spite of the queen's order. Taramis spoke to us then, and told us that she had reconsidered the proposal made her by Constantius, why, only yesterday she threw it in his teeth in open court, and that she had decided to make him her royal consort. She did not explain why she had brought the Shemites into the city so treacherously, 
But she said that, as Constantius had control of a body of professional fighting men, the army of Koran would no longer be needed, and therefore she disbanded it and ordered us to go quietly to our homes. Why, obedience to our queen is second nature to us, but we were struck dumb and found no word to answer. We broke ranks almost before we knew what we were doing like men in a daze. But when the palace guard was ordered to disarm likewise and disband, the captain of the guard, Conan, interrupted. Men said he was off duty the night before and drunk, but he was wide awake now. He shouted to the guardsmen to stand as they were until they received an order from him, and such is his dominance of his men that they obeyed in spite of the queen. He strode up to the palace steps and glared at Taramis, and then he roared, This is not the queen! This isn't Taramis! It's some devil in masquerade! Then hell was to pay. I don't know just what happened. I think a Shemite struck Conan, and Conan killed him. The next instant the square was a battleground. The Shemites fell on the guardsmen, and their spears and arrows struck down many soldiers who had already disbanded. Some of us grabbed up such weapons as we could and fought back. We hardly knew what we were fighting for, but it was against Constantius and his devils, not against Taramis, I swear it. Constantius shouted to cut the traitors down. We were not traitors. Despair and bewilderment shook his voice. The girl murmured pityingly, not understanding at all, but aching in sympathy with her lover's suffering. The people did not know which side to take. It was a madhouse of confusion and bewilderment. We who fought didn't have a chance in no formation, without armor and only half-armed. The guards were fully armed and drawn up in a square, but there were only five hundred of them. They took a heavy toll before they were cut down, but there could be only one conclusion to such a battle. And while her people were being slaughtered before her, Taramis stood on the palace steps with Constantius's arm about her waist, and laughed like a heartless beautiful fiend. Gods, it's all mad, mad. I never saw a man fight as Conan fought. He put his back to the courtyard wall, and before they overpowered him the dead men were strewn in heaps thigh-deep about him. But at last they dragged him down, a hundred against one. When I saw him fall I dragged myself away, feeling as if the world had burst under my very fingers. I heard Constantius call to his dogs to take the captain alive, stroking his mustache with that hateful smile on his lips. The smile was on the lips of Constantius at that very moment. He sat his horse among a cluster of his men, thick-bodied Shemites, with curled blue-black beards and hooked noses. The low-swinging sun struck glints from their peaked helmets and the silvered scales of their corselets. Nearly a mile behind, the walls and towers of Koran rose sheer out of the meadowlands. By the side of the caravan road a heavy cross had been planted, and on this grim tree a man hung, nailed there by iron spikes through his hands and feet. Naked but for a loincloth, the man was almost a giant in stature, and his muscles stood out in thick corded ridges on limbs and body which the sun had long ago burned brown. The perspiration of agony beaded his face and his mighty breast, but from under the tangled black mane that fell over his low, broad forehead, his blue eyes blazed with an unquenched fire. Blood oozed sluggishly from the lacerations in his hands and feet. Constantius saluted him mockingly. "'I am sorry, Captain,' he said, "'that I cannot remain to ease your last hours. But I have duties to perform in yonder city. I must not keep your delicious queen waiting.' He laughed softly. "'So I leave you to your own device and those beauties.' He pointed meaningly at the black shadows which swept incessantly back and forth high above. 
Were it not for them, I imagine that a powerful brute like yourself should live on the cross for days. Do not cherish any illusions of rescue because I am leaving you unguarded. I have had it proclaimed that anyone seeking to take your body, living or dead, from the cross will be flayed alive together with all the members of his family in the public square. I am so firmly established in Koran that my order is as good as a regiment of guardsmen. I am leaving no guard, because the vultures will not approach as long as anyone is near, and I do not wish them to feel any constraint. And that is also why I brought you so far from the city. These desert vultures approach the walls no closer than this spot. And so, brave captain, farewell. I will remember you when, in an hour, Taramis lies in my arms. Blood started afresh from the pierced palms as the victim's mallet-like fists clenched convulsively on the spikeheads. Knots and bunches of muscle started out of the massive arms, and Conan beat his head forward and spat savagely at Constantius's face. The voivode laughed coldly, wiped the saliva from his gorget, and reined his horse about. "'Remember me when the vultures are tearing at your living flesh,' he called mockingly. "'The desert scavengers are a particularly voracious breed.' I have seen men hang for hours on a cross, eyeless, earless, and scalpless, before the sharp beaks had eaten their way into their vitals. Without a backward glance he rode toward the city, a supple, erect figure, gleaming in his burnished armor, his stolid, bearded henchman jogging beside him. A faint rising of dust from the worn trail marked their passing. The man hanging on the cross was the one touch of sentient life in a landscape that seemed desolate and deserted in the late evening. Koran, less than a mile away, might have been on the other side of the world and existing in another age. Shaking the sweat out of his eyes, Conan stared blankly at the familiar terrain. On either side of the city and beyond it, stretched the fertile meadowlands, with cattle browsing in the distance where fields and vineyards checkered the plain. The western and northern horizons were dotted with villages, miniature in the distance. A lesser distance to the southeast, a silvery gleam marked the course of a river, and beyond that river sandy desert began abruptly to stretch away and away beyond the horizon. Conan stared at that expanse of empty waste shimmering tawnily in the late sunlight as a trapped hawk stares at the open sky. A revulsion shook him when he glanced at the gleaming towers of Koran. The city had betrayed him, trapped him into circumstances that left him hanging to a wooden cross like a hare nailed to a tree. A lust for vengeance swept away the thought. Curses ebbed fitfully from the man's lips. All his universe contracted, focused, became incorporated in the four iron spikes that held him from life and freedom. His great muscles quivered, knotting like iron cables. With the sweat starting out of his graying skin, he sought to gain leverage to tear the nails from the wood. It was useless. They had been driven deep. Then he tried to tear his hands off the spikes, and it was not the knifing abysmal agony that finally caused him to cease his efforts, but the futility of it. The spike heads were broad and heavy. He could not drag them through the wounds. A surge of helplessness shook the giant for the first time in his life. He hung motionless, his head resting on his breast, shutting his eyes against the aching glare of the sun. A beat of wings caused him to look, just as a feathered shadow shot down out of the sky. A keen beak, stabbing at his eyes, cut his cheek, and he jerked his head aside, shutting his eyes involuntarily. He shouted, a croaking desperate shout of menace, 
and the vultures swerved away and retreated, frightened by the sound. They resumed their wary circling above his head. Blood trickled over Conan's mouth, and he licked his lips involuntarily, spat at the salty taste. Thirst assailed him savagely. He had drunk deeply of wine the night before, and no water had touched his lips since the battle in the square that dawn. And killing was thirsty, salt, sweaty work. He glared at the distant river, as a man in hell glares through the opened grill. He thought of gushing freshlets of white water he had breasted, labbed to the shoulders in liquid jade. He remembered great horns of foaming ale, jacks of sparkling wine gulped carelessly or spilled on the tavern floor. He bit his lip to keep from bellowing in intolerable anguish as a tortured animal bellows. The sun sank, a lurid ball in a fiery sea of blood. Against a crimson rampart that banded the horizon, the towers of the city floated unreal as a dream. The very sky was tinged with blood to his misted glare. He licked his blackened lips and stared with bloodshot eyes at the distant river. It, too, seemed crimson with blood, and the shadows crawling up from the east seemed black as ebony. In his dulled ears sounded the louder beat of wings. Lifting his head, he watched with the burning glare of a wolf the shadows wheeling above him. He knew that his shouts would frighten them away no longer. One dipped, dipped lower and lower. Conan drew his head back as far as he could, waiting with terrible patience. The vulture swept in with a swift roar of wings. Its beak flashed down, ripping the skin on Conan's chin as he jerked his head aside. Then, before the bird could flash away, Conan's head lunged forward on his mighty neck muscles, and his teeth, snapping like those of a wolf, locked on the bare, waddled neck. Instantly the vulture exploded into squawking, flapping hysteria. Its thrashing wings blinded the man, and its talons ripped his chest. But grimly he hung on, the muscles starting out in lumps on his jaws, and the scavenger's neck bones crunched between those powerful teeth. With a spasmodic flutter, the bird hung limp. Conan let go, spat blood from his mouth. The other vultures, terrified by the fate of their companion, were in full flight to a distant tree, where they perched like black demons in conclave. Ferocious triumph surged through Conan's numbed brain. Life beat strongly and savagely through his veins. He could still deal death. He still lived. Every twinge of sensation, even of agony, was a negation of death. By Mithra! Either a voice spoke, or he suffered from hallucination. In all my life I have never seen such a thing. Shaking the sweat and blood from his eyes, Conan saw four horsemen sitting their steeds in the twilight and staring up at him. Three were lean, white-robed hawks, Zalgir tribesmen without a doubt, nomads from beyond the river. The other was dressed like them in a white girdle collet and a flowing headdress which, banded about the temples with a triple circlet of braided camel hair, fell to his shoulders. But he was not a Shemite. The dust was not so thick, nor Conan's hawk-like sight so clouded, that he could not perceive the man's facial characteristics. He was as tall as Conan, though not so heavy-limbed. His shoulders were broad, and his supple figure was hard as steel and whalebone. A short black beard did not altogether mask the aggressive jut of his lean jaw, and gray eyes, cold and piercing as a sword, gleamed from the shadows of the kafia. Quieting his restless steed with a quick, sure hand, this man spoke. By Mitra, I should know this man. Ay, it was the guttural accents of a Zuagir. It is the Cimmerian who was captain of the Queen's guard. She must be casting off all her old favorites, muttered the writer. Who would have ever thought it of Queen Taramis? 
I'd rather have a long, bloody war. It would have given us desert folk a chance to plunder. As it is, we've come this close to the walls and found only this nag. He glanced at a fine gelding led by one of the nomads. And this dying dog. Conan lifted his bloody head. If I could come down from this beam, I'd make a dying dog out of you, you Zaporoskan thief, he rasped through blackened lips. Mitra, the knave knows me, exclaimed the other. How knave do you know me? There's only one of your breed in these parts, muttered Conan. You are Olgerg Vladislav, the outlaw chief. Ay, and once a hetman of the Kozaki of the Zaporoskan River, as you have guessed. Would you like to live? Only a fool would ask that question, panted Conan. I am a hard man, said Olgerd, and toughness is the only quality I respect in a man. I shall judge if you are a man or only a dog, after all, fit only to lie here and die. If we cut him down, he may be seen from the walls, objected one of the nomads. Olgerd shook his head. The dusk is deep. Here, take this axe, Jebal, and cut down the cross at the base. If it falls forward, it will crush him, objected Jebal. I can cut it so it will fall backwards, but then the shock of the fall may crack his skull and tear loose all his entrails. If he's worthy to ride with me, he'll survive it, answered Olgerd imperturbably. If not, then he doesn't deserve to live. Cut. The first impact of the battle-axe against the wood and its accompanying vibrations sent lances of agony through Conan's swollen feet and hands. Again and again the blade fell and each stroke reverberated on his bruised brain, setting his tortured nerves a-quiver. But he set his teeth and made no sound. The axe cut through. The cross reeled on its splintered base and toppled backward. Conan made his whole body a solid knot of iron-hard muscle, jammed his head back hard against the wood, and held it rigid there. The beam struck the ground heavily and rebounded slightly. The impact tore his wounds and dazed him for an instant. He fought the rushing tide of blackness, sick and dizzy, but realized that the iron muscles that sheathed his vitals had saved him from permanent injury. And he had made no sound, though blood oozed from his nostrils and his belly muscles quivered with nausea. With a grunt of approval, Jabal bent over him with a pair of pincers used to draw horseshoe nails, and gripped the head of the spike in Conan's right hand, tearing the skin to get a grip on the deeply embedded head. The pincers were small for that work. Jabal sweated and tugged, swearing and wrestling with stubborn iron, working it back and forth in swollen flesh as well as in wood. Blood started, oozing over the Cimmerian's fingers. He lay so still he might have been dead, except for the spasmodic rise and fall of his great chest. The spike gave way, and Jabal held up the blood-stained thing with a grunt of satisfaction, then flung it away and bent over the other. The process was repeated, and then Jabal turned his attention to Conan's skewered feet. But the Cimmerian, struggling up to a sitting position, wrenched the pincers from his fingers and sent him staggering backward with a violent shove. Conan's hands were swollen to almost twice their normal size. His fingers felt like misshapen thumbs, and closing his hands was an agony that brought blood streaming from under his grinding teeth. But somehow, clutching the pincers clumsily with both hands, he managed to wrench out first one spike and then the other. They were not driven so deeply into the wood as the others had been. He rose stiffly and stood upright on his swollen, lacerated feet, swaying drunkenly, the icy sweat dripping from his face and body. Cramps assailed him, and he clamped his jaws against the desire to retch. Olgerd, 
watching him impersonally, motioned him toward the stolen horse. Conan stumbled toward it, and every step was a stabbing, throbbing hell that flecked his lips with bloody foam. One misshapen, groping hand fell clumsily on the saddle-bow. A bloody foot somehow found the stirrup. Setting his teeth, he swung up, and he almost fainted in mid-air. But he came down in the saddle, and as he did so, Olgerd struck the horse sharply with his whip. The startled beast reared, and the man in the saddle swayed and slumped like a sack of sand, almost unseated. Conan had wrapped a rein about each hand, holding it in place with a clamping thumb. Drunkenly, he exerted the strength of his knotted biceps, wrenching the horse down. It screamed, its jaw almost dislocated. One of the Shemites lifted a water-flask, questioningly. Olgerd shook his head. Let him wait until we get to camp. It's only ten miles. If he's fit to live in the desert, he'll live that long without a drink. The group rode like swift ghosts toward the river. Among them Conan swayed like a drunken man in the saddle. Bloodshot eyes glazed, foam drying on his blackened lips. End of chapter 2